Alrighty. Well, thanks everybody for coming out tonight. Um, really excited to introduce our speaker, um, Palav Kasuri. So um, Palav uh, did his his uh, PhD studies at uh, Columbia, and then was actually here in Boston, in, in well, I guess Cambridge, on the north side of the Charles, um, uh, doing uh, doing postdoctoral studies with uh, Zhao Weizhang, and now he's starting his own lab at the Salk and. Uh, you know, we talk mostly about protein design, so I'm pretty excited to hear a little bit of DNA design work. And uh, um, yeah, Paul, please take it away. Sure. Um, thanks, Chris. It's uh, wonderful to be here. It's good to see some familiar faces. I recognize uh, Dan, a good old friend, and uh, Una, I see, is here too, and Alex. Cool. Well, anyone else uh, I didn't give a shout out to? You're also, I'm very happy you're all here. Uh, this is going to be quite the journey, actually. Uh, so I will tell you about DNA origami design. I'll tell you a little bit about protein mechanics. Uh, but in general, I, I just thought I'd give you sort of an, um, an overview of my, uh, my trajectory as a scientist and how it's led me to where I am today and kind of the different techniques and the different um, projects I've incorporated into my research. It all fits into what I'm doing here at the Salk now. And uh, there are quite some um, crossovers with protein design as well. So I hope you, um, you all appreciate it. And if you have any questions or something isn't clear or you have some really crazy idea, just shout out and interrupt me. I'm happy to take questions at any time. Um, all right, let's get going. All right, so let's, uh, let's start with a, a deep dive into my, my personal history. Um, I, I, I was born and raised in, in Stockholm in Sweden. As uh, is what it looks like, you should go visit. And uh, uh, after uh, studying physics in college, I went. I, I, I reached my my life's uh, biggest dream of going to CERN, and I worked there uh, in a nuclear physics experiment for a year. And um, actually, fun fact: my project was uh, quite literally to make gold. So by definition, I was an alchemist. So that was that was my project. So I, we we had a nuclear experiment. We long story, uh, cool stuff. Um, and I um, saw at the time that, that there was this sort of revolution in, in molecular biology and specifically in biophysics that in many ways mirrored what we had seen in physics in the, in the past um, uh, century. And so I was excited to try to see if, if we, could, we could use the sort of some of the similar mindsets that I had when I approached physics problems um, in um, molecular biophysics. And so I moved to New York and did my PhD in molecular biophysics at Columbia University. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about this work. And then after my PhD, I moved up to Cambridge, did my postdoc with Xiaowei Zhong across the river from you guys. And, uh, and now I'm all the way over here on the West Coast um, at Salk. And so if you haven't been to Salk, you should definitely come visit. It's gorgeous and, and it's a small institute. We're 50 faculty. We're associated with UC San Diego, but we're completely independent uh, when it comes to our research. And um, we don't have to teach, so I can spend all my time here in lab coming up with crazy ideas. All right, let's get started. So I like to uh, start my presentations with this uh, video of a baseball pitcher. And uh, the reason I'm showing you this is to illustrate what an incredible machine the human body is. And um, so when you think of machines, you think of moving parts, right? Like there, there are different forces that, that make these moving parts move relative to each other. Most machines that we interact with in our daily lives have moving parts on the macro scale. But what makes our body special is that we have moving parts on all levels from the macroscopic components of our body all the way down to the molecules that, that build it up, right? So this amazing machine is capable of, of accelerating it, you know, an uh, artificial uh, rock to a speed of 100 miles per hour. Well, some of us can uh, in less than a second. And this is something that makes humans unique. And in fact, uh, there's been recent proof that uh, this has been a big part of our recent evolution is to, is to actually be able to do these kind of, uh, perform these kind of movements. Um, throwing things have been a, a way of hunting for a long time, for instance. All right. So in my research, uh, I've been tackling how these um, components move relative to each other and what their mechanical properties are, uh, all the way from the muscles uh, to, to the proteins, to the uh, interactions between the protein and DNA that gives rise to all of these components being built. 
And to do that, I've used a number of different methods and I'll cover some of them today. In fact, I'm gonna tell you three stories, um, each one on a sort of a different level of complexity. So I'll start out telling you a little bit about muscle elasticity, where it comes from. And, um, and then I'll go into some of my PhD work on, on um, how disulfide bonds are formed during protein folding and some of the fundamental rules that guide uh, where disulfide bonds are formed uh, in, in native uh, proteins. Uh, and then finally, I'll, I'll go into my more recent work on protein DNA mechanics, where I've used DNA origami to study the movements of proteins relative to DNA. So to start off, uh, let's, let's look into muscle elasticity. So if I pause this video right here, you might notice that the angle of the pitcher's arm is what looks like a little bit uncomfortable uh, in position. And, and it's actually for a, a very good reason. Um, can anyone guess why? I mean, I, I kind of gave it away, right? But can anyone guess like why the pitcher has to adopt this, this sort of unnatural stance with his arm? Something to do with 100 miles an hour and muscle elasticity? Yes, yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. It's actually a uh, great guess. Um, in order to be able to throw as fast as baseball pitchers do, you, you can't rely on the, the ATP hydrolysis driven contraction of muscles. You also have to load the spring elements of your muscles. In fact, your muscles are both um, motors, linear motors, but they're also spring-like elements. And so uh, if you want to reach these kinds of speeds, you need to load the spring of your muscles um, in series and then release all of these springs at the same time so that the arm works like a catapult. And this is absolutely essential to be able to throw fast. But it's also really important for, for running or jumping. So for instance, if you take a marathon runner such as um, Alex here in the audience, uh, there's no way that you could run an entire marathon. Nobody could run an entire marathon if they had to use ATP to um, ATP hydrolysis to push off from every single step and produce all the force of the running from ATP hydrolysis. You need to bounce. You need to bounce to be able to conserve energy and for your muscles to be more efficient. And so this elasticity comes from somewhere. And it turns out that it's actually not that simple where it comes from. Uh, a more clinically relevant example is uh, in the heart. Every time your heart fills up with blood, it stretches out uh, against the, the pressure of your blood. And depending on how spring-like your, um, your, your heart wall is, uh, it, it, it can determine how much blood it, it's able to fill up with and, and um, pump out in each uh, heartbeat. So if we can figure out where this elasticity comes from in the muscle, uh, and more importantly, if we can figure out ways to modify or manipulate this elasticity on a molecular level, then we have levers to manipulate all of these systems that I'm talking about, every muscle, but also non-muscle systems in our body. So to find out where this elasticity come from, we have to zoom in uh, quite close into uh, the anatomy of the muscle. So this is a skeletal muscle, but it's similar for cardiac muscle. It consists of individual fibers and each fiber consists of repeating units. Each repeating unit is called a sarcomere. These sarcomeres are beautifully structured molecular machines uh, that mainly consists of these three components or these three major large components. It's uh, myosin, actin, and titan. And of those three, um, the most popular ones, the ones that most people learn about are actin and myosin. These are the components that produce the, um, the, the forces that come from ATP hydrolysis. Myosin walks on actin and it, it sort of uh, pushes the filaments relative to each other. But in a relaxed muscle where myosin and actin are detached from one another, uh, all the force within the sarcomere is held across this one molecule called titan. And titan is actually where the intramuscular elasticity comes from. If you zoom in on Titan, turns out that it's one single polypeptide that stretches from the Z line, the, the wall of the sarcomere, all the way to the midpoint. And that could be in, in, in humans, for instance, that's well over a micron, sometimes even two microns uh, from, from, from uh, one end to the other. And this is one single polypeptide that is, um, that is translated and folded in one go in the, in the cells. And I think it's just absolutely miraculous how this, these poor ribosomes manage to piece together so many amino acids into one chain. If you look at the structure of titan, it consists of um, these repeated Ig domains. Each Ig domain is individually folded, and it looks like knots on a rope. 
So you might wonder why why do we need all of this structure? Why does it and why does it have to be a single polypeptide? Why can't we just assemble it from multiple polypeptides like like uh, actin, for instance, or or uh, uh, microtubules? Well, we think the reason is that because titan bears so much force, we need to have covalent bonds along the whole length of the protein. That way, we prevent injury within the proteins themselves. So uh, during my PhD, I studied the mechanics of titan using atomic force microscopes, and in particular, these custom-made atomic force microscopes, um, where we, we, we tailor-made them to uh, apply precise forces to single proteins and then study the length of the protein as their um, um, uh, as they're uh, subject to these forces. So the way an AFM works is uh, there's a platform uh, that we can move up and down using a piezo positioner. And we attach molecules to, to uh, a cover slip on this platform. And then um, the other side of the protein is attached to the tip of a, a flexible cantilever. And so we can measure the angle of this flexible cantilever by bouncing a laser off of the backside of it and detect the laser uh, reflection on a force detector. So this is just a simple photodiode. So if we pull on the uh, bottom of the protein, that will pull on the cantilever. And so we can feel the force that the protein is feeling by looking at how much the cantilever bends. And if we can calibrate and know the spring constant of the cantilever, we know the force on the protein. Uh, so we developed a, um, a variant of this uh, atomic force microscope that incorporated a feedback circuit. So we can apply um, now a set force to this protein and see how the length of the protein changes over time. And so we use this to see how Titan would react if you apply a certain force to it. And so, um, well, this is what the microscope looks like. It's, um, you can buy it now, it's a commercial product. Um, you would imagine that for a spring-like element, if you apply a force, it would go up to the length that corresponds to that force if this protein apply, uh, um, obeys the, 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 the um, Hooke's law of, of um, elasticity. But what actually happens is, if you study this, this single protein recording that you see here, um, this particular protein, it's a fragment of human cardiac titan. It has uh, five domains in this case. Each domain in its uh, folded length from end to end is about five nanometers. So the full length of this uh, filament of, um, of five, um, uh, titan domains should be around 20 nanometers if we stretch it out. So we have a, if we apply a force of about 160 piconewtons, this is a high force for a muscle to see, but it's something you might see in, for instance, if, you, if you're um, subjecting your muscles to a very high force, which could cause injury, for instance. So if we apply 160 piconewtons to this titan filament, it stretches out to its full length of about uh, 20 nanometers, but then, then something um, remarkable happens. It actually unfolds in these um, uh, distinct steps. And so each one of these stepwise length increases corresponds to one of those ID domains unfolding, going from the folded to the unfolded uh, conformation. And so we think that this is, um, we think that this is a, a mechanism that muscles um, have evolved in order to protect themselves for excessive, from excessive forces. So instead of having something break, what you're doing is, uh, if you're applying a really high force to a sarcomere, the titan domains within that sarcomere will individually unfold and release more length of the protein. And that could protect you from um, things ripping apart uh, irreversibly. And um, most importantly, if we remove the force, so here you see a recording in the red, you see the length of the titan uh, protein. And uh, in the black down here, you see the force that we're applying. So if we apply a force, we unfold the titan, every single domain of this titan uh, fragment. If we then uh, remove the force, put the force to zero piconewtons, you can see that the, the chain uh, of, of, um, of titan collapses a, into a, a length that is near zero. Um, but it doesn't do so in, in steps. It, it rather collapses as a collective polymer. But then if you apply a force again, a few seconds later, you can see that these steps appear again, which indicate to us that these individual titan domains have refolded and regained their mechanical stability as independent units within the chain. So the picture that starts to emerge is that if you stretch out Titan, and what we're suspecting now is basically any protein that consists of um, uh, independently folded domains, um, if you release the force or you let this protein collapse, it will first collapse in a sort of collective manner, but then it will segregate into independent uh, domains and then uh, regain their, their, their mechanical stability. 
So we could use these, this to study how Titan folds and unfolds. But what I was thinking about was, can we modulate this balance in some way? Because if this is happening in our muscles as we go about our daily lives, and these domains are, are dynamically unfolding and refolding, um, if we can modify this balance in some way, then have, we have a, a handle on how to change the elasticity or the force response of, of, um, of our muscles. So this is really cool. Wait, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Um, the thing that, yeah, it's, it's remarkable. One of the things that just jumps out to me is that the domains unfold individually, but fold at the, all refold at the same time. Right. Just wondering like, if they're all repeat domains, why does one unfold before another? Why don't you have multiple domains all unfold at the same time? Uh, you mean why 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 it's not sort of um, uh, uh, why it doesn't happen simultaneously for multiple domains? Yeah, I guess if the domains are all the same and you're pulling on the polymer, so each domain is feeling the same stress. Why does yeah. one pop and not? Like, how does that one? Oh, pop? great question. Okay, so if we if you look really closely, these are beta sheets, uh, and so they they are they are anti parallel beta sheets, and so the the when you apply force from end to end, the force is actually um, transmitted across multiple hydrogen bonds within this anti-parallel beta sheet. And so there's one beta sheet, uh, a pair of, of beta strands in particular, that holds the brunt of the force when you're applying the force. And all of those, so it, it's sort of like when you pull, it kind of torques in a way so that the, the force is distributed across multiple hydrogen bonds. And all those hydrogen bonds, um, are brought closer and closer to uh, their, their sort of rupture length or rupture distance. But what actually triggers the unfolding is uh, thermal fluctuations um, in this strained conformation. So the unfolding um, probability increases at a higher force, but we're not actually triggering the unfolding with the force. We're just making it easier for thermal fluctuations to overcome. It's kind of like heating up um, hybridized DNA. Uh, and, and eventually, uh, from thermal fluctuations, it will come apart. And by increasing the temperature, is analogous here to increasing the force. Yeah. So it's a it's a stochastic process, and it happens independently in each one of these domains, since they're 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 unaware of each other, if you will. They're just seeing the force that is uh, across each independent domain. Great question. All right. Makes sense. Thanks. So so to to see if we could find a way to. Um, uh, to modulate this, this folding unfolding, we looked into what actually happens chemically in muscles. Can I, can, can I just uh, very quickly follow up because I'm too curious. Um, so, so how do these forces that you apply with the cantilever uh, compare to the physiological forces that this protein would experience in the cell, I mean, in, in the muscle? Uh, you know, does it also unfold thermally in the muscle? Or That's a great question. Uh, we don't, to answer your last question first, um, we do not think they thermally unfold um, very often in, at, at zero force. It's, it's a quite un, unlikely. So if you just look at the equilibrium distribution of folded versus unfolded domains in a solution, uh, they're all pretty much folded. So you need force. Sure, yeah. I, I meant that, uh, you know, uh, when you actually throw the baseball, you know. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Pulling of course. apart by force. Yeah, yeah. So, so in this case, uh, this is much higher than what we think happens. But to tell you the truth, there is nobody who actually knows what the force is that Titan feels in vivo. In fact, there are very few cases in which we know the forces on proteins that bear forces in vivo. And that's actually part of my research now is I'm trying to figure out, I'm, I'm, well, long story, but I'm building force in vivo force sensors to try to once and for all answer this question. And I'm, I'm going to use DNA origami in, in I, I'll talk about it later if you want. Uh, maybe I won't. We'll see. We'll see. You can ask me later. <laughs> so um, we don't know. What we think is happening, and I, I published some papers with um, from my PhD lab where we looked at roughly how often do we see. So trying to go about it the other way around. So we don't know how to measure forces in individual proteins inside of uh, muscle tissue, uh, mostly because uh, these these sarcomeres have thousands of proteins in parallel. And so we don't really know how the force is distributed along those. And we don't even know the stoichiometry. We don't know how many of them there are uh, precisely. So um, what we can do instead is we can see how often do things become unfolded. And, and you, you'll see in, in some of the coming slides that we found that uh, 
when we try to modulate this balance, we see a pretty significant effect in actual muscles, which means that they have to be going back and forth uh, quite regularly in muscles. So that can give us a clue as to kind of what forces are happening. But, um, but when I started this project, we had no idea. I mean, we basically, we applied a high force. We saw that they unfolded. We apply a lower force. It becomes more rare that they unfold, but pretty much at any force, including, um, yeah, I mean, at, at, at zero force, the lifetime of the fold state is like days, right? But, it, but then it, 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 the, the rate increases exponentially with the force. So it, it, you get pretty quickly to something that uh, it's, okay, this is all hand wavy. Short, long story short, um, we think it's like in the tens of piconewtons maybe uh, in vivo, but we have no idea really. But we know that it's enough force to unfold proteins. Thanks. <laughs> Does that answer you? Yeah, great. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. I, I I thought it was really frustrating. We do this extremely well calibrated experiments to see exactly what happens when we apply a certain force, but nobody knows what's happening in vivo. So we're doing these experiments. Like the missing piece is like, well, what's actually going on in, in people? Well, you'll see. Yeah. So um, to go back to like, well, can is there any mechanism that can modulate this balance of folding and unfolding? Um, yeah, and uh, it, so on a chemical level in muscles, one thing that we know for sure is that there is a lot of oxidative stress in muscles. Muscles uh, produce oxygen, free oxygen radicals when we exercise, but also uh, if they're injured in some way. And so here you see an oxidative stress marker in skeletal muscle. It's highly uh, elevated in, in, in um, uh, this punch biopsy from humans who have exercised. I think this is somebody who was on a training bike for a while. Um, and it turns out that it, the, what happens in cells is that they have this huge um, abundance of glutathione, which glutathione is a tripeptide, a small uh, molecule that is found in, in like high millimolar con concentration in all cells. And, um, uh, and it, it's one of its uh, functions is to absorb all of those, uh, those free oxygen radicals and convert them into other less toxic uh, compounds. And so, Whenever you have oxidative stress, you have a, a shift in the uh, overall state of glutathione. It goes from a reduced to an oxidized state. And um, what we also know is that if um, there is excessive oxidation of glutathione, or even if there is a little oxidation of glutathione, some proteins become glutathione-related, meaning that the cysteine residues on, on exposed cysteine residues on proteins can be modified by a glutathione uh, molecule. And so now you start to see that there's, um, uh, there's this pathway for, you know, we know that there's a, a oxidation of glutathione in muscles that are experiencing stress or exercise. And we know that proteins with cysteines become glutathione related when glutathione is oxidized. Now the question is, does titan get glutathione related? And the answer is yes. So titan is a, a target for glutathione relation uh, in human tissues as we found in this experiment. And if you look um, along the length of titan, where these cysteines are that glutathione can attach to, um, here you see the abundance of cysteines um, per amino acid, uh, per, per thousand amino acids, uh, as a function of uh, position along the polypeptide. And you can see there's a, there's a big peak of, of extra cysteines here in the flexible region of titan. And if we do homology modeling on these titan domains, you can see that um, most of these systems are actually buried. They're not exposed. So they shouldn't be modified unless for some reason um, the protein would unfold. Um, okay. All right. Uh, by the way, I think, uh, yeah, Dan answered some really good questions in the, in the chat. You could, he's an authority on force spectroscopy, so ask him anything. Um, all right. So, um, so here's so now there's like a hypothesis that evolves and, and, and starts to come into place. So maybe what's happening is that if titan domains are unfolded under force, uh, they become vulnerable to oxidation. And so if we have this situation of these exposed sites in the presence of oxidative stress, maybe titan would become uh, modified, which could then you can imagine like if, if an unfolded protein all of a sudden has this like big charged uh, tripeptide just stuck on it in the middle, that might interfere with folding, right? So it seemed natural to us that maybe that would change the balance of, of unfolding and refolding. So we wanted to just ask this question, does oxidation of these buried sites actually affect tighten folding in some way? 
I'll take you to the same journey that I went through when I, I first did these experiments. So here's a fragment of Titan. We unfold it. We see all these beautiful staircase-like extensions on each protein domain unfolds. And we did this in a buffer containing a ton of oxidized glutathione. So it should be able to modify the cystics. And we left the protein. Oh, wait. So first of all, uh, we did these experiments in a buffer containing oxidized glutathione. And, and the first time we unfolded it, everything looks normal, right? So it didn't affect folded titan. And if we leave it in this unfolded state for two seconds and then remove the force, still looks very similar to before. We leave it in the folded or in the collapsed state for five seconds and then apply force again. All right, okay, no effect. This looks exactly the same as the first time. So it's kind of boring. Maybe it didn't work. Maybe this hypothesis was wrong. Or maybe we didn't leave it exposed for long enough. So we would do the same experiment again, but we leave the protein unfolded and dangling in its uh, exposed state for a longer time. This time there's no refolding. So we don't see any steps. But the second time we apply a force, the protein just goes to its full length right away. There's no residual uh, mechanical resistance. What we have is a much softer protein that is more compliant, that is more stretchy, right? So um, and this, this is really beautifully, I think, shows that um, under oxidative stress, these tightening domains um, become uh, progressively softer over time. We can see that it's specific to glutathione, um, if we don't do it with glutathione, we don't see this effect. But also if we mutate the cysteine, remove the cysteine residue, we also don't see this effect even in the presence of glutathione. So we know it's a specific modification of the cysteines within the, the titan domains. And we did some modeling to see what this would mean um, because we can measure the mechanical properties uh, very precisely of these, these titan domains in, with atomic force microscope. And if we ramp, if we scale this up, because uh, systems biology is very gratifying in muscle because it's such a neatly organized system. So if we extrapolate and see what the, we think the stiffness would be of the entire titan molecule, um, uh, we find that at, if we increase the redox potential, if we increase the level of uh, oxidative stress, you would actually expect the, the stiffness of titan to go down dramatically over the physiological range of oxidation states that we see in muscles. And so uh, we did some experiments uh, together with some collaborators on um, human uh, cardiomyocytes. So these are uh, heart muscle cells from human donors. And what we saw was the exact same thing. Here you see the normalized resisting force that this cardiomyocyte is providing when you stretch the sarcomere to different lengths. And you can see in the orange here, if we do this in an oxidizing buffer, we see a much lower response force than if we do this in a reducing buffer. Uh, and so, so this, uh, seems to play a major role in, in skeletal muscle tissue. And so in summary, what this means is if you, have, um, if you have oxidative stress in the presence of strain, then you can tune the, the, the softness of muscle from stiff to soft and back to stiff. And this is because these uh, oxidative modifications modify the folding of titan domains. And intuitively, this kind of makes sense because we see um, I mean, maybe not glutathione specifically, but in general, it makes sense that there is a mechanism for tuning this flexibility of muscles because we see athletes of different sorts having muscles that are, um, that are, that are optimized for, for different purposes. In some sports, you would like stiff muscles, um, whereas in other sports, you, you, you would benefit from having more flexible muscles. And we know that we can reversibly change muscle stiffness over long time scales. This also opens avenues to treat a variety of different heart diseases that, um, that affect people who are suffering from a stiffening heart wall, for instance, after uh, a heart attack. So we're um, looking into um, ways of developing this as a therapy as well. All right, short break. Uh, stretch your limbs, you know, provide some oxidative stress. Uh, all right. In this shorter part uh, of my talk, I'll, I'll give you a brief um, overview of what we discovered um, about how disulfide bonds are formed. Because you can imagine that with this system, we have an elegant way of seeing if proteins are folded or not. If they have this like stepwise unfolding, it means they were folded, right? They wouldn't give you that step otherwise. But we can also see if there's a disulfide bond. Because if you pull on this thing on the left here, uh, it will stretch out completely. But if there's a disulfide bond, uh, it, would, it, would, it would sort of stop at the disulfide bond because the disulfide bond is covalent and resists much higher forces than than the rest of the folded state of the protein. 
And what many biologists um, don't really realize, I shouldn't say that, they probably do, but maybe it's not a big part of, of molecular biology as we know it, is that disulfide bond formation requires catalysis. It doesn't just happen spontaneously. Because if you have two thiols, two cysteine side chains, and you want to form a disulfide bond, you have to transport away two protons, which is easy, but then also two electrons, which is hard. So this is not something that just happens spontaneously unless there's a catalyst present. Fortunately, there are lots of catalysts. Oxygen is a catalyst for this, for instance, molecular oxygen, but it's a very slow process. And most importantly, if you have a folded protein with two cysteines close to each other, they might just sit there forever and never form a disulfide bond because they're shielded from the solution. So no molecular oxygen can reach them or, and, and no other catalyst either. So, um, so it, seems, it seems like kind of a tricky problem. Like you have this protein and it needs to fold and some proteins need disulfide bonds to, I mean, I'm sure a lot of the proteins that you guys are developing uh, have disulfide bonds or do they? Maybe they don't. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they need to be stiff, right? Like you, you make these uh, really rigid proteins. So um, in vivo, there are many proteins that have disulfide bonds. In fact, almost every secreted protein in the human uh, proteome has at least one disulfide bond and they must be formed before the protein folds because otherwise it might be too, too late. So the way that disulfide bonds are formed in vivo is in the endoplasmic reticulum. And uh, the ribosome translates proteins and it, if they are, be, if they are uh, to be exported, then they, they're threaded as they're translated, they're threaded into the um, endoplasmic reticulum and then they fold in the, in the endoplasmic reticulum. And there are enzymes that specifically catalyze the formation of disulfide bonds. Predominantly in humans, we think the PDI, protein, protein disulfide isomerase, is the main agent that catalyzes disulfide formation. And so now there's, it's kind of like a, um, a chicken and the egg problem. Like which happens first? Is it the folding or is it the, the disulfide formation? Well, we know that, that once it's folded, it might not happen anymore. So the disulfide formation has to happen somehow before, but when? And more importantly, if you have a protein with lots of cysteines, like, I don't know, BSA or albumin, which is in your blood, has like, I don't remember, I think like 17 disulfide bonds or something. There's a lot of them, right? So you have a lot of different cysteines. And now this is a combinatorial problem. Which one of these, like for each one of these cysteines, which one should it pair with? And if it pairs with the wrong one, the protein might not even fold it because it's a, it's a covalent bond, right? So this is a, this is a, to me, it seemed like just a really tricky problem for proteins to figure out, but somehow they figured it out. And, and, and more importantly, um, we now have a tool to study how it's figured out because we can study both the folding and this disulfide formation independently in the same experiment if we use atomic force microscopes. So we use Titan as a, uh, as a model system for this and we put engineered disulfide bonds in different places to test how the positioning of a disulfide bond um, affects how it forms and when it forms during protein folding. And so we did this with and without uh, protein disulfide isomerase. Uh, as, you, as I said before, I mean, if you pull a protein from end to end and it doesn't have a disulfide bond, it's much easier to, to unfold it completely. If you pull on it with, um, when it contains a disulfide bond, it will be shorter um, just because we can't break the disulfide bond with these forces that we're using. And in this particular case, uh, I'm using a, um, uh, an engineer form of Titan that has disulfide bond that if it is formed, it will give a five nanometer shorter uh, length of, the, of, of that particular domain. So the way uh, I started looking at this was by unfolding the protein completely. And then in the presence of uh, PDI, uh, I released the force, allowed it to collapse, and then waited to see what would happen. And then after some time, just pull it back up again to see if it was shorter. And if it was shorter, that meant that there had been a disulfide formation event. So here you can see that there's one disulfide was formed, another disulfide was formed, and the third disulfide was formed here. And what's really striking is that all of these disulfides were formed um, where they were supposed to be. Supposed to be is relative because this is an artificial uh, disulfide bond, but they were formed within the domain. And this is particularly striking because as you saw before, when we released the force, the whole protein just like collapses as one big lump. But somehow the, the disulfide bonds were always formed within the domains. So even though it's a collective um, collapse of the protein, PDI somehow selects for the, the cysteines and pairs up the cysteines that, um, that are close together in the folded state of the protein. 
And importantly, this did not happen if, when we used other um, oxidizing agents. It was specific to the enzymatic activity of, of PDI. So, uh, so our, our sort of general conclusion was that maybe what PDI is doing is it's, it attaches to one of the cysteines um, and then it hangs out there and waits for the protein to decide which other cysteine goes together with this in the folded structure. And when you have some partial folding, then PDI catalyzes the formation of these two, um, uh, of, of this disulfide bond. And that helps the proteins themselves select which disulfide bonds should be formed and which ones should not be formed. So that could help us understand how this one enzyme, PDI, could successfully catalyze disulfide bond formation in thousands of different proteins, even though they all have different structures. So what that tells us is that the, the, um, um, the mechanism for disulfide formation is actually encoded, or at least the pattern of disulfide formation is encoded in the, in the native fold of the protein, as opposed to being some externally imposed rule. All right, brief break, stretch your muscles. Third part has to do with DNA. Can I, can I ask a quick question about the disulfide bond formation? Sure. Is there any chance that PDI is catalyzing the bond formation um, sequentially with nearby cysteine residues as it's coming off the ribosome? In other words, during translation, is it just linking up next after next after next as it's coming out of the ribosome? Is that, is that a possibility or am I, is that what you were saying and I missed it or caught it? Yeah, I mean, kind of, right? So, so, um, so what we think happens is that it, it does exactly, it does sort of decorate, it, First of all, it doesn't stay on for a very long time. It, it has a it can come on and come off from each one of these. And so we think it, it does sort of decorate each, um, decorate and protects in a way, each uh, cysteine as it comes out of the ribosome. But this is only in the endoplasmic reticulum. This does not happen in the cytosol. Uh, and so as the cysteine comes out, PDI attaches, and then it, you know, it's a dynamic thing. But when a second cysteine comes out, if those two are brought close together from protein folding, then PDI catalyzes the formation. But if they're not, then PDI would just come off and maybe another one would come in later. Uh, I mean, that's, yeah. So it's, um, hmm. this happens. How are, how are you saying that it can tell whether it's from protein folding or just like stochastic near, nearbyness? Oh, great question. Yeah, so if you think about this, um, you mean if it's, if it's because they're close, like, so for instance, let's say that this uh, sulfur here um, in the native uh, form is, is supposed to pair with this one here. But you're, you're asking, maybe it's pairing with this one here just because it's close in sequence as opposed to close in the native. Yeah, yeah like as it's going down the folding pathway, it might be more likely to accidentally be near that one, even if that's not the true folding pathway. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, that's a very valid question. So what we did to, to figure that out was we placed um, these cysteines close together. So we placed them in different positions within the, the folded uh, protein, but we did so in a way that in some cases, they were actually closer in sequence to a cysteine in the next domain. And even when they were close, so let's say in this case, if these two cysteines are closer together in sequence, but this cysteine is actually closer to this one in the folded state of the protein. So these two are in the same domain, but these two are in different domains then PDI would always favor um, the cysteines that are in the same domain, even if they are farther away in sequence. Yeah, that, that's great, um, really cool. But I'm just wondering how you think PDI does that in terms of like, you're saying it like hangs around until the protein has part yeah, of the whole thing. I, I don't, I can't, just like, okay. I, yeah, I, don't, I don't know, know if I don't it's know just how. like a slow catalysis mechanism or, or what you think. Um, so exactly, so it's, it's probably, in, in the same way that sort of uh, if you have two, let's say you have two um, molecules that can, can react with each other spontaneously, just a, a you know, first order reaction rate. Um, if, if you connect them with a polymer, then they will have a higher, like the, local, the effective local concentration will be higher. So the attempt frequency will be higher and therefore the reaction rate will be higher, right? So I think that's all it, all it is. In, in a folded state, the, the effective uh, concentration is much higher. Then, okay, okay. So it's like once it reaches an actual folded conformation that it likes, then it's there long enough for, to allow PDI, whereas the stochastic accidental folding, they're just not there long enough. 
Exactly. Okay. Even in an unstructured polypeptide, which is still, okay. you know, like even if you have two um, cysteines in an unstructured polypeptide that are, uh, you know, only a few amino acids apart, that doesn't provide sufficient local concentration. You need it to be folded. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you so much. Okay. Can can I just uh, jump in and clarify one thing? Um, sure. So, so protein PDI stands for protein disulfide isomerase, yes. right? So, in addition to just introducing disulfides, presumably it can also isomerize them, which means, and I believe that, that this is one of its main roles in the endoplasmic reticulum, is that even if an incorrect disulfide bond forms. For example, because two cysteines are close to each other in sequence and therefore higher effective concentration, but they are disfavored thermodynamically once the protein falls to the native state, the PDI will attack that incorrect disulfide and hang out and wait until the correct sulfur attacks back and forms the right disulfide in the protein. Yes, with a caveat. It will do that if the incorrect disulfide is exposed. But in some right. cases- right. But, but when proteins are not, when the disulfide is not correct, the protein is not correctly folded. The not necessarily. You could have, for instance, you could have a, a superficial cysteine like on the surface of a protein and it could dimerize with another protein that is also folded and yeah, you can have a disulfide. That would never be resolved, right? And you could have uh, any in proteins that have multiple domains, uh, it could be, you could easily bury, you know, a, a misformed disulfide next to a folded protein domain, and it could also be. So there, yes, you're right in, in many cases, and in fact, most cases that have been studied, uh, that is the case. I mean, it's part of like the un unfolded protein response is to upregulate PDI, so they can take care of these, um, these um, uh, um, misformed disulfides. But it is only true if they are exposed, which is the case. I mean, there's a correlation for sure, as you say. If you have misformed disulfides, you're more likely to have flexibility in the protein, which is more likely to render them exposed. And then PDI could, uh, but uh, presumably uh, resolve them, yes. Yeah. So, so in the sarcomere, um, we're out of the ER. Is, is there a PDI around there? No, there isn't. Um, and so it's actually still a debate on whether or not these um, cysteines, in because there are a lot of cysteines. We don't know if they, there are no good ways to study if native Titan actually has disulfide bonds or if they just have cysteines that happen to be close by. To me, it's sounded kind of strange that from an evolutionary perspective, there's an enrichment for cysteines that are close to each other. <laughs> Like in some of these homology models, you would see that there are like pairs of cysteines, but in some cases there are just cysteines hanging out in proteins in, in these ID domains uh, alone as well. So since we can't experimentally determine whether or not uh, they are um, oxidized, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of tricky. It turns out that it's difficult to, I mean, maybe, maybe things have changed in the last couple of years, but last time I checked, you, could, you couldn't just take proteins from cells without guaranteeing that. I mean, you could, it was difficult to assess whether if you found disulfide bonds that they hadn't been introduced when you purified the protein. Like you, it was, it's very ambiguous whether or not those disulfides were present in Titan. So there could be other agents for disulfide oxidation, um, but we're not sure. Maybe one more comment on that. Um, I think the unfolding, maybe it has something to do with how this uh, IG domain partially unfolds or unfolds, because the other issue I have with it is, is that an IG domain is a double beta sheet, but you have these clasps, clasps, if you will, the loops on the top and on the bottom. So it doesn't simply unfold into two hamburger buns, you know? So, so, so how would that unfolding did anybody do MD with AFM? At, do you know? Yeah, yeah. We, we, what exactly is your question? So I think the unfolding geometry may answer that because may, maybe the disulfides aren't um, disrupted in the unfolding. And, and the other problem, so that I have I have a hard time picturing the unfolding of the IG domain because it is 
tied up together, both halves of this of this beta sheet are tied up together at the top and at the bottom in an IG fold, right? Um, tied up together. No, uh, so it's 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 just um, the topology is sort of like um, it's not knotted, if that's what you mean. It it's a, the the beta sheets go so they're anti-parallel on both sides. It's just like wrapped around in a way. Nope, nope. Some of the loops, at least in antibodies, they reach over between the two beta sheets. Maybe I mean, the IG4 this is the structure. Is yeah, this is the structure here. You can when you when you say reach over, you mean that it's actually knotted? Is that what you mean? No, not knotted. Like like on each end of the IG fold, of, on each end of the beta sheet, there are some loops, at least in an IG fold in an antibody. That's for sure. That that reach uh, that basically bridge the two beta sheets at the top and at the bottom, so you can't just imagine that as two hamburger buns that come apart. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. Strings yeah. bringing your hamburger together. Right, right, right. Okay, yeah. It's not two hamburger buns. I that was too simplified. What it is is that it, there's one um, pair of beta strands that ruptures first, and then after that, everything has a much lower unfolding um, barrier. And so this becomes okay. So then that pair may not be disulfide bonded. Correct. It is not. No. Oh, okay. So it's the A and the G strand or something like that. A and the F strand. Yes. I do. Yeah. Okay. I don't remember which ones it is exactly. You're you're right. It's um. So the disulfide bond is actually further inside. It doesn't prevent the initial unfolding. If that's what you're asking. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. No, that helps. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's take a look at DNA. So if you zoom into a, a, an organ consists of cells, the cells consist of, um, you know, they all have nuclei, most of them do. And if you look in the nucleus, there's tons of chromatin. And chromatin is DNA with structure and decorated with proteins. And in fact, it has this really intricate shape. If the closer you look, the more fascinating I think it gets. And what I want you to pay attention to is in, in this drawing, of different proteins interacting with DNA. All of these happen in, in the nuclei of cells. Um, they are all mechanical distortions of the structure of DNA. So every interaction of a protein with DNA comes with a mechanical movement. And in the vast majority of cases, these movements have never actually been observed. And I just think it's, um, it's very clear to me that a big part of biology has to do with the mechanics of DNA, because for every one of these reactions to happen, you need something mechanical to happen. Like for a transcription to happen, you need to open the DNA and, and peel it apart. And for, for repression to happen, you need to change the curvature of DNA or you need to obscure it somehow. And so for every one of these reactions, if we can measure, if we can see the mechanical movements, then we can learn things about how these processes regulate the expression of our DNA. And so as a physicist, I like to um, sort of simplify this process into uh, um, individ independent degrees of freedom. So if the blue uh, protein is interacting here with uh, DNA, you could either induce rotation, uh, linear movement, or bending. So these are just three modes of, of um, macro scale movements of the DNA relative to the protein. And this is the case for uh, any process involving um, proteins and DNA. So I will give you an example for rotation. If a polymerase is transcribing DNA, uh, it needs to rotate as it moves along the, um, the helix of the DNA. And this is ca the case for nearly every protein that moves along DNA is it also produces a rotation. So if we have a way to measure rotation of DNA, then we can track these processes potentially at their independent uh, ind individual reaction steps that they happen. And so um, how can we do this? Well, um, it's independent reaction steps is a, is a strong word. There are many sub steps as well, but um, one convenient uh, scale to look at it is, is for transcription, for instance, you need to transcribe one base at a time. And so the steps are very small. They're about a third of a nanometer, which is difficult to detect experimentally. Um, same can be said for the rotation. For each rotational step, there's a 35 degree shift. And that is also very difficult to detect, but we can amplify it. 
So if we just attach something to the DNA, maybe we can actually study this, this rotation in an easier way. So um, my thought was, well, if we just attach a lever arm to the DNA, we can amplify a single base pair step from 35 degrees to a, a shift of, of 40 nanometers if we have, say, a fluorescent marker at the tip of this lever arm. And uh, in order to be able to do this, we need something, a lever arm that has a rigid construction, a sleek profile for low drag, and uh, is easy to integrate with DNA. So what could possibly give us these, these, um, these three characteristics? It turns, DNA, it turns out that DNA origami is actually very well suited for this purpose. Uh, and so for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, DNA origami is just like protein folding, but much easier. Uh, so it was invented the, the initially by Nadrian Seaman at, at New, York, New York University in the 80s, but it was really um, boosted by uh, some inventions by Paul Rothman at Caltech in 2006. The way we do this is we take a scaffold DNA, which is a long unstructured single-stranded um, piece of, uh, of DNA, uh, usually around uh, 7,000 bases, and then we combine it with these artificially made staple strands. And these staple strands are short oligos that when combined with the scaffold DNA, um, assembles the scaffold into any shape of our liking. And so now we've come a long way and, and some of your colleagues um, in Harvard Medical School at the Beast Institute have, um, have, have really pushed this technology further. So this is by William Shi and, uh, and Peng Yin. They've been able to make these uh, sort of three-dimensional space filling shapes using um, DNA double helices. And so uh, here was my idea. So if we have an enzyme such as uh, RNA polymerase and, we, and it's rotating the DNA, uh, we could attach, uh, say, a propeller to it and decorate the propeller with, with fluorescent dyes. And now we should be able to just trace the fluorescent dyes as they move in a circle. We can make the circle as big as we want. We should be easily able to see this in a microscope. So I call this orbit for origami rotation-based imaging and tracking. Um, and uh, this is kind of what we imagine it would look like. Um, so I collaborated with Peng Yin and his graduate student at the time, Ming Jia Dai, and this is the design of the DNA. Uh, turns out uh, it's very easy to decorate DNA with, with fluorescent dyes. And uh, it really works amazingly well. When, when you have the re right recipe for one of these DNA origami shapes, you just order these oligos, it's a couple of hundred dollars, and it gives you the infinite um, amounts of whatever structure you want. And so these are the propellers seen in an AFM. And um, I could use this to track how enzymes rotate DNA. So to start, I use this, um, these helicases. Right PCD is a, a, a homologous recombination enzyme. What it does is it, it grabs onto um, double-stranded breaks. So at the, the end of a double-stranded piece of DNA, and then just peels apart the two strands. And as it does that, you can imagine that it, it, it must swivel the DNA around its axis, although no one had seen this before. So if you have, for instance, if you go out in the sun and you get some UV damage, you might get these double-stranded breaks. And homologous recombination enzymes in bacteria, it's RecPCD, there um, there are homologs in humans, they would grab onto these double-stranded and, and just peel it off and, and process the DNA before it starts repairing it. So here's the experiment. Take a microscope slide, deposit a bunch of RecPCD molecules, and then feed them with DNA that is attached to a rotor. Now, in the presence of ATP, they should start chewing up the DNA and peeling it apart. And if they were rotating the DNA, we should see that as a rotation of the rotor. So since it worked in PowerPoint, we were very encouraged. And here you see the actual data. Um, here is a microscope image showing you hundreds of these rotors, each rotor attached to one molecule of RecPCD. If you zoom in on these and film them with, a, well, in this case, 500 frames per second, um, you can see um, these are the pixels on the camera. You see kind of a blur jiggling around. Um, importantly, the, the diameter of the rotor is about the size of a pixel. So we can't see it much clearer than this unless we do some post-processing. Post-processing is easy. We know there's one spot giving, you, uh, giving us this light. And so we can just determine where the center of this light blob is for each frame. And then we can track the trajectory of the tip of the rotor blade um, in real time. And so this gives us a very precise uh, measurement of exactly how much this enzyme is rotating the DNA as a function of time. We can use this to build um, biochemical measurements uh, and, and we can correlate these with, with conventional measurements of how fast these enzymes actually move. It matches really well. So it seems that they're unencumbered by, by hanging out on the surface. 
uh, or being attached to a propeller for that matter. But more importantly, in one single experiment, we can get hundreds or even thousands of measurements of single enzymes rotating single pieces of DNA. And this gives us an incredible rich insight into what exactly these enzymes are doing. So you can see that they're not all the same. I mean, some of them just run straight through the DNA, unwind all of it. Some of them pause, some of them go backwards, some of them change their mind. There's all sorts of personalities out here. At this point, I feel like my work is more like zoology, where I go out into nature and just study these enzymes in their native, well, not quite native, in their captive environment. And then from their behavior, I'm trying to figure out what they're actually doing. And so we discovered a bunch of things for um, RecBCD, for instance, that it it's reversible, it goes backwards sometimes, <laughs> and we could dissect what the different motors were doing, and we could use different um, uh, uh, mutations to, to study what the different components were doing. But I want to uh, just end on uh, a second study that we did of transcription, because for transcription, we would imagine that it, it's actually transcribing one base at a time, and so maybe it would be possible to see these movements. Um, and so in, again, there's a RNA polymerase rotating DNA as it's transcribing uh, a gene. And we're tracking the rotation of the propeller here. And if you look close enough, you can actually see the single steps of, of transcription. And so these are the first measurements of how RNA polymerase rotates DNA uh, in a stepwise manner. Um, and we could fit this using computational algorithms and then figure out exactly what the enzyme is doing at every single base along the transcript. And one of the things that are really striking were that not all steps were the same height. In oh, fact, in fact, um, sometimes the step sizes were were um, were larger, and sometimes they were smaller. And it seems to be a sequence dependence. So we can learn a lot about the the um, the process of transcription and the specific sequence that is being transcribed just from watching these rotational movements of the rotor. All right. I'll stop there. Um, if you want to, I'll talk about my future research. Otherwise, I'm happy to take some questions. So I'd like to thank um, my mentors um, over the years, from my PhD advisor, Julio, to uh, my postdoc advisor, Xiao Wei, and my collaborators, Peng Yin and Richard Lee. Amazing colleagues at Columbia, at Harvard, here at Salk, uh, everywhere. And I've had um, great experiences with, uh, with, uh, at all institutions and with my, my wonderful funding agencies as well. Um, and now we're starting a lab at Salk. We already have a bunch of people and we're hiring. So if you're interested or you know someone who's interested, uh, feel free to reach out. Thank you. So Palav, I'm intensely, this is great. I'm intensely interested on how you're going to combine the fantastic work you've done on understanding muscle elasticity and these awesome DNA origami designs to uh, crack crack the mysteries of what's happening down at, down at low forest and muscles. What, what are your future plans? <laughs> sure, I'll give you, I'll give you a quick, uh, um, I'll give you a quick rundown on that. Yeah, okay, I, so in, in general, it's, um, I can tell you, so in, in general, we're, we're going to do work on, on three different levels. So we're doing molecular uh, ensemble and tissue scale research. So for the molecular scale, um, we're continuing the, some creative DNA origami designs that allow us to, to see the movement of, of protein DNA interactions. And then for the ensemble level, we're creating synthetic muscles where we combine DNA origami with uh, protein motors that move on DNA to create the contractile motions that you typically see in muscles. But in our case, we can, we can create synthetic muscles as a model system for muscles, but also as actuators that we can use for all sorts of things. And then on the scale of tissues, yeah, we're building these in vivo force sensors. And it, it builds actually off of, um, of, um, of some of the work that has been done in spatial transcriptomics recently. So um, in my postdoc lab, there was this method um, that we invented called Mur Murfish. And um, Murfish allows you to see the transcriptome of cells in, 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 in situ, so in, in uh, tissues that you, you take from, from organisms. 
and I'm uh, working on repurposing it so that instead of, of um, instead of looking at transcriptomes, we can look at molecular forces. So if you take a, um, uh, a, a tissue that uh, is expressing these genetically encoded in vivo force sensors, then you'd be able to, to take the tissue, section it, um, image it, and then read out uh, on a cell level and even on a molecular level, um, what the force is uh, in each independent force sensor. And so, in, in some, uh, and so you could use that to reconstruct a three-dimensional map if you take serial sections of the the um, of the force distribution within the tissue. Uh, and this would be extremely useful for to understand, for instance, heart disease, where where a lot of the pathophysiology comes from mechanical overload of, on the tissue itself. So, in the first iteration, these sensors are binary switches. They will tell you whether or not the threshold force has been reached. And so by creating a mosaic or patterning in a stochastic manner, many um, sensors with different threshold forces, we can read out in each independent molecule whether or not, uh, well, what that threshold force was and whether or not it has been reached. So each sensor is binary, but um, they also have a, an associated barcode that tells you what kind of sensor it is. Does that make sense? So this is a, just a quick overview. If there's more to it. Actually, one of the things that I'm, um, um, uh, that we're, we're um, um, that we're uh, working on right now is uh, different strategies to connect um, these um, genetic sensors. So they, they're made from DNA or RNA, and we need to connect them to proteins. But we need to connect them in a way that is mechanically robust. And so there are not that many options for how to uh, rigidly uh, or, or mechanically um, interface DNA or RNA with proteins in a way that actually can withstand high forces. And preferably, it should be specific too. So maybe a sequence specificity would be, you know, very useful. Do you know of any, any such um, tools? Um, excuse me. I, I mean, I, on that note, could you describe how that you attach the, that DNA structure, that propeller to, in that example you gave, uh, what is that actual linkage between, you said you, um, attached yeah, to what, uh, the, in that case, the RNA, I guess that, or, or whatever the DNA. Oh, that's just, DNA. Um, um, in that case, it, that was just DNA to DNA. His DNA to DNA is very easy to connect. It's you just need a, a, a portion of it that is um, that is complementary. So in this case, I'll, I'll show you. I see. So you're describing the scenario of attaching something like that to protein. Yeah. So DNA to DNA is easy. You have a strand of DNA that you want to connect to, um, uh, or double strand of DNA that you want to connect to a rotor, for instance. The rotor just needs to have something hanging off that is complementary to an overhang in the DNA down here. But for proteins, it's 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 more complicated. I mean, one of the things we're thinking about is, is the proteins that that um, have a sequence specificity, like with Cas9, you can make a sequence specific, but you need you need it to form a covalent bond somehow. I mean, ideally, you would have it form a covalent bond with with the um, with the DNA or RNA that you of, of you're choosing. And I think if we, if we can figure out how to universally connect DNA or RNA with, with proteins um, in, a, in a sequence specific manner, that would have incredible uses for, for biotech you know, all over the place because there's so much DNA and RNA nanotechnology being developed um, where we create these, these really intelligent sensors and devices that we can then read out using sequencing or, or fluorescence in situ hybridization. And for now, it's, it's really cumbersome to, um, to link these things to biological structures, right? Because most structures are not DNA or RNA. So that's a, that's a big missing piece, but, but that's something that we're, we're trying to, uh, to figure out. Isn't that aptamers, uh, the field of aptamer design? Yeah. Isn't that a thing? Yeah, so aptamers, you can make them, um, in some cases, specifically bind to protein epitopes, uh, but the interaction is not very strong. Uh, mm. You can get pretty high specificity, which is useful if you want a replacement for an antibody, for instance. But mechanically, it's basically not there. 
So it's not going to work from my case, but in, in, in for some other applications that might be useful. The in vivo idea is really exciting. Um, Murfish is such a powerful technique. Um, just thinking about the force sensors. So that's a really neat idea. I, I guess I'm just wondering, because so the, if I'm understanding this correctly, you have a DNA device and it has some force threshold with which it unfolds. And when it unfolds, it reveals a linear stretch of DNA that you can hybridize to. Is that, right, right. Is that, when you fix the cell, does that lock that open? So you need something else so that once it's open, uh, it cannot go back to the folding. So you need something that is irreversible. And uh, we have a few different options for how to make that happen. One of them is just to have a high abundance of something complementary. And then as long as that complementary thing was introduced after or it's, it's in a separate compartment from where the original switch was, was um, um, synthesized or, or, or transcribed. Um, it, it, it should only bind if, if there's a mechanical unfolding of that, of that switch. So you would have the switch open and something that locks it in place. And then that thing that locks it in place could actually be the thing that you're reading out. Yeah. So I think there, the, um, the power of, of these um, multiplex hybridization readouts, it's, it's sort of only just begun. So if you think about sequencing, like 10 years ago or 20 years ago, like people were sequencing and that was the end of it, right? And then people like Jonathan Weissman came around and said, oh, you can actually use sequencing to find out all these other things. Now we have a mature technology that can give us these enormous data sets. And if we can couple that to whatever process of our choosing, now we can learn about that process with this infinite detail and richness, right? And so this, I'm convinced the same thing is gonna happen to hybridization-based fluorescence imaging approaching, approaches because it's spatially precise. You can make these beautiful tissue-wide maps that give you the precise location in each one of these hybridization locations, right? And if we, need, if we figure out clever ways to couple that readout to, to different biological parameters, then we can build off of the platform that already exists that gives us this like enormously rich data, right? So that's what I'm in the business of doing. I'm building force adapters for Murfish. Like that's, uh, I, it's, uh, <laughs> it seems like I don't have to do the hard part of figuring out Murfish, you know? <laughs> I, I just need to make the adapters. But you can think of it uh, of any other um, property in the cell, like you can make pH sensors, or you can make uh, you know salt concentration sensors, or synaptic. Um, um, you know, you can you can make detectors for different types of um, like messenger molecules or signaling pathways or something else. Eventually, there's so much more we want to know about the cells other than just their expression patterns. Like the expression pattern is part of the puzzle, but it's far from being the whole story, right? If we want to build like really quantitative systems biology um, uh, models, we also need to know what's happening to signaling pathways, post-translational modifications, and carbohydrates, and lipids, and all of these other molecules. So for each one of them, we need an adapter. And, and that adapter is where innovation needs to happen. Because as long as we can interface whatever that is to DNA or RNA, then we're done. Like, that's easy. The rest, the rest of it is easy. We can use sequencing or, or hybridization-based approaches. Maybe, maybe someone with uh, you know, talent in protein design could solve this, this problem. Palov, why does the rotor have four arms? Um, it seems like you only need one for imaging. <laughs> yeah, we, we learned that the hard way. We're like, I, I just thought of rotors. I was like, well, they rotate. They need to have four arms. That's how a propeller works. Otherwise, it's unbalanced. It's going to be lopsided. But then I realized that that's, that's just true in a macroscopic scale. It worked perfectly well with a single arm. And that has a, a quarter of the, of the drag. So does the, does the production copy, the one that went into the paper, have one arm? <laughs> no, no, it had four. The four arms actually turned out to be useful for other things. So first of all, I wish I had talked to you earlier. Second of all, um, the, the four arms are good because when the rotor binds to the, the so let's say you have like the rotor and it, it has like a DNA that comes out, right? And then it, it binds to the enzyme. So the enzyme grabs it. Uh, in reality, the rotor is actually much wider than the DNA is long. So it's not really drawn to scale in all of my images. 
And that meant that if I had four arms, then it kind of forced the rotor to be in this um, orientation that is, is um, parallel with the surface. And that made it, you know, it's it was kind of cool. That's it's like a geometric sense. selection of a binding orientation. So it ensured that every single rotor was facing um, up and, and the, the DNA was vertical. For the, the one arm rotor, um, some of them would bind in the right orientation, but some of them would bind like sideways uh, to enzymes that were sitting sideways on the surface. And then the, the rotor arm would like hit the surface and then it wouldn't go any further. So you can do a post-processing data selection to get rid of that. But at the end of the day, it was the, the forearm rotor worked plenty for us. So, so that was good for, for those reasons. So is this also a method to orient the protein in the right way? I was wondering about that. Yeah. That is uh, really cool. Yes, I'm actually thinking of how to uh, best use this because if one thing, okay, listen to this. This is, this is crazy. This could be game changing. Sometimes you do want a functionalized surface where you put like an enzyme or something that is facing up, right? Uh, in, in many uh, biotech assays, you, you kind of want something that is like, you know, doing some enzymatic thing. So I was thinking if we just make an adapter made of DNA origami that, 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 um, that attaches to your enzyme of choice or your protein of choice that you want to pattern the surface with, and it coats it on one side, but not the other, then you would select for, um, for orientation when you deposit it on the surface. And then you could just remove the DNA later, right? So this could be like a, a little delivery vesicle uh, for, for proteins that you want to pattern on a surface. So I'm just looking for a, a, a partner in crime who can help me commercialize this because I feel like there must be a lot of use for this in, in, in biotech. Ooh, I have a follow-up question. Oh. Um, how do you feel about single-stranded DNA? That's in, more complicated. Just in an emotional sense or what? Uh, no, not <laughs> in a relationship hey, I mean, sense. Some, in a, in a scientific sense. What? Huh? Not in a relationship sense, in, in, a, in a scientific sense. I mean, if, if there was single-stranded DNA at, um, at the end of your forearm rotor, um, the structure of that would be much more flexible, right? Yes, yes. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. What do you mean? So if, if it would be beneficial to have single-stranded instead of double-stranded? No, if you if you could apply this technique to single stranded DNA as well. Oh no, no, it's a, it's it's much too flexible. So yeah. um, unless you use something like locked DNA, a locked nucleic acid or something, but those aren't no, they still have rotationally free bulk. The good news of of the 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 benefit of double stranded DNA is it is really like it. I mean, I think it's it's difficult to. At least when I read in textbooks, I thought of DNA as this like flexible polymer, but the, the persistence length of DNA, uh, of double-stranded DNA is, um, is 50 nanometers. That's 150 base pairs. So if you know the orientation of one part of the DNA, you know the orientation like 50 bases over. It's, it's the same direction. Like it's, it's like a, a solid rod on, on the scale of bases. And it's only over uh, many hundreds of bases that you start seeing uh, appreciable flexibility. A single-stranded DNA, the persistence length is one base. So, <laughs> so the, you have no idea where the second base is gonna be oriented. Um, so you can't really control it in the same way. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, no worries. Cool, all right. Well, um, what's who's watching TV? Yeah, so I think the um, number of participants in Zoom vastly underestimated the uh, size of your audience here. It looks like you've got like eight or nine folks. <laughs> I see, I see. Oh, that's okay. We're projected on the TV. Okay, so I'm on, in that room, I'm actually on two screens on opposite sides of the room. So yeah, okay. nice. loop here. Cool. Well, um, if you can think of any, if anyone can think of uh, something they would like DNA to do, please let me know. I think we can make it happen. The cool thing is we can, we can functionalize DNA with nearly anything these days. So if, if you think about DNA, it's, it's, a, it's the perfect scaffold for all these applications when we want to precisely organize things on a molecular um, scale. The DNA is like, that's the scaffold we should use. It's cheap, it's like, you know, you can replicate it and you can modify it with so many different things. And, um, and as we're seeing like, so now, especially now there's gonna be a, a big drop in sequencing costs. I don't know if you've heard, there's a new San Diego startup that is, is 
disrupting the business. Anyway, in, in um, parallel with this uh, uh, drop in sequencing costs, there's been an enormous drop in synthesis uh, costs too. So in the future, you can think of DNA as like free, essentially. So anything you can build out of DNA is going to be future proof. Like it's going to be just super cheap. So, so yeah. So, so in that regard, an obvious, you know, provocative question, uh, uh, given your previous, uh, um, you know, work, um, which is, so, so how easy is it to, or hard to incorporate reactive thiols into DNA? It's very easy, yeah. So which means that you can tether it to any protein that contains cysteines, disulfides, and so on. Yes, yes. It's hard to do it in a sequence-specific way, but yeah, in principle, if, if you had... You can incorporate the thiols into the DNA in a sequence-specific way. Right, but how do you make... Oh, I see what you mean. But yeah, then, and then the, if you did this in vitro, that's absolutely true. Yeah, you can do that. I mean, you can also put, put like amino acid, um, primary amine reactive uh, groups on the DNA that would attach to lysines, for instance, or the amino terminus of, of proteins. Sure, yeah, sure. there are many ways to do that. I'm talking about specificity, of course, yes. Yeah, yeah, cysteine is good because you can, you can make uh, like protein mutants that have a, a single cysteine, and then you know exactly where it's attaching. So if you do this in vitro, that's true. But if you do it in vivo, now you have a lot of cysteines that you could potentially bind to. And, uh, and also if you do it in the cytosol, it's never gonna oxidize. So you have to do this in either extracellularly or in the ER or someplace. Right, certainly, yeah. Yeah, so for my application, I want to put these in the sarcomeres on Titan. And um, uh, for that, I would need to have something that, that would, would specifically attach to Titan or something that I put on Titan in vivo. All right, yeah, yeah. So I actually, I, yeah, we've made um, some some of my collaborators um, from my PhD. They actually made a transgenic mouse that had uh, interspersed within the Titan domains in specific locations had uh, protein domains of different sorts, like cleavage sites to see you know they could specifically cleave Titan in, in locations and to see how that affected Titan stiffness uh, or the muscle integrity. But you could also imagine that in the same way we can make transgenic mice where in sequence with all these Titan domains, you just have like one of these adapter domains or two of these adapter domains that bind to our, our four sensors, right? So those, that, that, could, that, could, that would allow us to bridge it. And that would also provide um, a pathway for the force that would, that would sort of short circuit the, the force trajectory within Titan. All right. <laughs> I think um, let's thank uh, Paul off one more time for an awesome seminar. Um, Thanks, you. Really enjoyed coming out today.